Please remain standing in body or in spirit for today's scripture lesson from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. The Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they, they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they prosecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Christ Church. I want to welcome those that are online also. Um, I know I've been here and up here for about a year now, and, uh, but I want to introduce myself a little bit more because with COVID, things are a little crazy, and we see some people some week, we don't see them the other weeks, and we got a lot of transitions happening in the church. So my name is Mike Porter. Uh, we've been actually a part of the church for five to six years. I am married to Melissa, and I have a son named Gabe. He's going into seventh grade. Uh, but it's been one year since I joined the staff at the church, and my role is director of men's ministry and discipleship, but now it is also interim youth minister. So that's, that's kind of my role at the church. And I do want to say something about this past week. This past week was incredible. It was a blessing for VBS, but it was also incredible to watch the youth uh, come and be a part of that, and the parents who put that together, Megan Doan, uh, Katie Alexander, and other parents that were a part of that. You know, it's interesting that you hear these little snidbits, the tidbits of things of wondering where the youth are. The youth are here. They're a part of things. It's a matter of um, where do we see them and what are they involved in? And when you see this past week, you can't help but be excited because you see such an incredible group of kids with such a heart to love other kids and uh, do whatever is being asked. So know this, the church is in good hands if these kids stick around and get involved in, in our, in our involved in where this ch- church is heading. They have an incredible heart and passion. So it was a blessing. And I know all that were involved with it just are amazed at this past week. So wanted to give a little thanks to the youth for everything that they did this week. It was, it was great. So let's just thank them. So this week, I'm continuing the series that we've been doing about the stained glass windows. And one of the things that uh, I shared online was that, you know, the windows, there is a function to them when they have started using them. And it's kind of like a picture book. So a lot of people couldn't read. and It's like a picture book. You'd be able to come in and hear the stories of the, uh, the scriptures and, and see those different highlights. This morning, I get to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm excited because we think about just that little passage that we talk about um, in the Beatitudes, but it's so much more. It uh, goes actually for three or for two, three chapters, five, six, and seven in the Matthews version, uh, and it is widely expanded. And so my, this morning, my hope is just to give us an insight of what those that may have heard it, experienced, may have been thinking about or questioning about or really challenged about. So that is my hope this morning. So let us pray. Pray, Lord God, pray. For Pray for this morning that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart may be pleasing to you. Pray that as we are here and that you will open our eyes and our ears to your word, to the excitement of just what you are calling us to do and how we are called to live our lives as your children. Lord, give us wisdom as we hear this. Give us courage. Give us the hope that you give. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Have you ever had one of those people come into your life who completely changes you, not because of what they do, but because of who they are. 
because the essence of who they are. You know, they are the same when you meet them, when they're out around other people, uh, when you're working with them and all these different things. And you see this love, this faith of Christ that is just in them. There's not a distinction between today I'm on and tomorrow I'm off. Or even in the midst of a, you know, of a, a day together where something happens and you see it kind of blow up. But you have those people that come into your life that totally change you because of who they are, their core. And when I was in my 20s, I, got, I had this uh, incredible friend that did that for me. His name was Sean. We met through mutual friends and through mutual ministries. And we had an opportunity to come together to get to know each other because we were working together and doing these different things. And the thing that amazed me about him is it didn't matter who you were, what was going on, you know, how crazy things got around. His heart was filled with with God's love and he showed compassion to whoever he met. And he was there and present. And you couldn't help but your life be drastically changed by his personality. Who he was, who he said he was, was. His essence as a person of faith, as a man of God, was there. And to be around him, he changed the lives of many people. And I feel blessed to be, be a part of that. During that season of life, we're, we're in our early 20s and things are happening. And I was working for a ministry and we had a great opportunity to go across country doing a fundraiser and raise money for the, this group. And so we invited him to be a part of that. We wanted him on the trip and we wanted, you know, his kind of attitude, his spirit to be with us. See, here's the thing about him, though, that, that I hope I, I honor. When he was younger, he was diagnosed with MD, mus- muscular dystrophy. And his parents tell the story about when he was getting ready for school one day, he picked up a brush and he went to brush his hair and he couldn't reach his head. And that's when they knew something was off. Something wasn't quite right with him physically. And they said when they, you know, it was one of those moments when you go to the doctor and it comes back and you realize this wasn't a quick fix. This wasn't something that was going to change. This was who he was. And he had this, he had MD and he was going to be a person that always had that. And the reality was he was, his muscles were going to continue to degenerate. But the thing was, it didn't change who he was at his core. And we had this great relationship. And so at that point in his life, he was starting to lose mobility. He walked with a cane. We would have to help him get up and out of chairs. He could drive, uh, but his car was modified a little bit. Um, But he was very limited. But we knew we wanted him. And so we went to him and we're like, why don't you come on this trip? It'll be exciting. We're going to go across the country. And he's like, how am I supposed to do this? And we're like, we'll modify it. You know, the thing about in your 20s, it's like whatever is in front of you, we'll figure it out. We don't care. And I know you guys remember that. And those that are in that age, you, you know what that feeling is like. It's like, if there's an obstacle, we're going to figure it out. And so we took this van and we, re, we basically retracted the seat some. We put blocks on the pedals so he could get up and we, we created steps so he could get up in the van and get in there. And then the way he had to drive was basically he would hold onto the wheel with his left hand and he would use his right hand and he would grab his leg and he would pick it up from the gas and he'd move it over to the brake. And then when we, we uh, had to keep going again, he would just move back and forth and you would watch him do this. And if you were sitting in the van, you, you were a little terrified by what was happening. <laughs> and so everything was going great. And of course, until it wasn't. So we were on this trip and we were going on this narrow road, two lanes, no shoulder. It just had drops on both sides and he was driving. And so you got to keep in mind, this van is modified for him. Uh, so it's, it's really not easy to move things around. So we come to a problem with the van and we have to turn around. And the only way to get around is to do one of those three point or even a four point turn to get him around. So I had to get out and get in front or I had to get in front of the van from where I was. So I'm out in front of the van and I'm trying to, you know, tell him, you know, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming and back up, you know, and trying to watch the edges. And so all of a sudden, you know, we're getting to the edge and we're close. And I tell him again, okay, you can come a little, a little bit further. And then I'm like, stop. Well, when he picks his foot up with his leg and he goes to put it back down, he puts it on the wrong pedal. And all of a sudden the van lurches towards me and I have to jump up on the van 
in order to not get knocked off the road and hoping that I'm not going to get knocked completely back off this path. And thankfully, I was able to grab a hold and then push off in a safe way to the side. And so we looked at each other. We're both in panic, you know, and it's like, okay, is this core going to stay the same or are we going to explode on one another? Thankfully, and so much because of his personality, we were okay. Like we just look at each other, you know, there's, you can feel like the boiling in the back of your, your mind and you're just like, ah. And we get it turned around and we collect it, take a deep breath and then, you know, things keep going and he's fine. We get the van where we need to go and the day ends. But it was that moment where everything was going where you're just like, oh, what's going to happen here? Are we going to, that you start to see his essence, that that faith was instilled in him. And as we looked ahead and we kept going forward and doing these things, the thing that kept coming up in just in our minds, our conversations was that we, we, we headed off. We knew we could do this trip. We know that the world looked at his situation with a lot of limitations. We didn't. We knew him. We knew who he was, and we knew we could accomplish his things, and we were excited about it. And as we continued on and and through that trip, we got to see how God was continuing to work in us through him. And then after that trip, later on, as he kept thinking about, okay, well, what's next? What next for him? You know, he ended up going off to Chicago to do a ministry, and we, and I moved to um, Huntington at that point, and we lost contact for a while. But the thing is, as I look back on that time, and I remember having conversations with his mom, because she would be asking these questions like, why is he going? He can't do this. And we're like, he'll be all right. He'll be good. You know, it was that courage that he had and that faith, knowing that no matter what was going to come in front of him, he would be able to continue to do. And it was partly because he knew who he was. This morning's passage, and we'll get back to Sean later on, but this morning's passage, that Sermon on the Mount, is kind of this moment in history where the disciples are with Jesus, they're up on the mountain, all this stuff's going on, and Jesus wants to sit them down. He wants to sit them down because he wants to to lay it out. There's chaos going all around, there are people all around, he wants to give them that, like, minute, that rallying cry to help them center on where they are. Scholars kind of dictate kind of say to this thing and and to a sermon and they kind of identify it as one of his manifestos. This is like Jesus' manifesto. And the reason that he's able to do this is because he is who he claims to be. Like he lives the essence of this. And so in this conversation that he's having, this teaching moment where he's getting into the Sermon on the Mount, he's being able to speak to his disciples, but he's being able to do it because they've been with him. They know who he is. They know the core of who he is. And as he's sharing with them, we kind of get to sit in the background as observers and look on, looking on. We get to come in it as people who may not know him, but we also get to come at it from the standpoint of the, the church, the institution, that may find it a little tough to hear his words. Because when you start to listen to them from that standpoint, you start to realize there's a little bit of a rub here. It, it bounces up against some of the things that we want and desire when you, we really start to hear what Jesus wanted from his disciples and the essence of who they were supposed to be. So I want us to take a look at this sermon in different pieces of it. And I want us to hear how this is very different than the world and how the world set it up. He starts off by setting this introduction for his disciples. And we call it the Beatitudes. And we look at it and we hear it and we think, oh, this is nice. You know, it's kind of like this encouraging thing. But when you start to weigh it against the world and think about how this lines up, you start to realize it's a little tough when you start to really hear these things. You know, because what God wants is all of us. He wants that essence of our character to change. And so listen to what is being lifted up and think about this in the contrast of what the world lifts up. These are the things that he says blessed to you poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, those who have been persecuted because of their righteousness, those that say that when people insult them and persecute them and falsely say all kinds of evil against them, they have been lifted up because they are with God, they are with Jesus. This is 
these are the Beatitudes. These are the things that, when we think about the Sermon on the Mount, these are some of the things that it represents. This is that essence, that character that God is kind of laying out, that Jesus is laying out in his manifesto. And he's setting kind of the, the foundation, but he doesn't stop there. That's where we get into the challenge of, it's easy to, to go to that and just go, okay, we're done. We got it. We, we think we got to figure it out. You know, but he goes on. And there are a couple other themes that pop out. So he sets this as the core identity, but then he moves on a little bit further. And he's talking about this idea that we are to be righteousness. We are to be in this right relationship. You know, it's a confusing word when we hear righteousness. But the very simple way to think about it is to be in right relationship. And he talks about this idea that if you are coming to worship and you have something wrong out there, some kind of disruption out there, leave your gift at the altar and go and reconcile that relationship and then come back. We all have families. This is something I think we all understand, that we have these relationships, and sometimes they get out of whack. We know when they're not right, and we know when we come into worship and they're just not right. It affects everything about who we are. Jesus is trying to help them understand that you need to get these things right in order that your relationship with God is right. And it's part of this character of who you are being called to, who are you being called to be, that essence, that core. And so he is challenging them to go out, to lay that aside. And it's a hard thing to do. We know that. It's easy just to ignore it. It's easy to be like, okay, well, I got these things in place and I'll set those aside and I'll come and do those things. Or I'll let that conversation stay over there and I'll come and worship. And yet he's trying to help us understand in this message that no we need to look at that and let that we need to go and deal with that in order for the other thing to get right because he goes on to talk about that when we seek God first and God's righteousness first all the other things come into place and what God's righteousness is is he wants us to have right relationships with people and that's a tough thing and we understand it so when we think about this overall message You know, we think about the Beatitudes, but we also think about the fact that we are being called to make those relationships right. And it's later on in this this sermon that we hear that golden rule, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. You know, God is continuing to kind of set that in place. Like, here's what I want of you. It is not what the world is calling of you. This is what I'm calling of you. And it is very different because our easy aspect of looking at it is, okay, I, I have faith, I can do this, this, and this, and I can keep building here and here, but it bounces up against it and, it, and it rubs, and we have to wrestle with that daily as we think about the Sermon on the Mount. It'd be nice to say, oh, we always got it, but the fact is, we are broken people, and we wrestle with that all the time. And so by the end of his sermon, we get to hear these words where he's reminding them about how they are going to build this up. So they're, they're hearing this, and we are hearing this, and he talks about at the end of it, it says, therefore anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because its foundation is on the rock. That's what we want our foundation on we see that, we hear that, we, we know that, and we have a great hope from it, yet we get challenged because we get these things bounced around on us. You know, it's calling us to respond. That's the thing about this message, it's this Sermon on the Mount. We can look at it and put up the attributes and say, okay, this is nice, but by the end of it, it's calling us to respond. It's saying, how are you going to build your house? How are you going to build your life? Are you going to build it on my words? Or are you going to ignore them? And it talks about when you ignore them, the water comes and it basically washes everything away. And we understand that because we feel that, we experience that. Yet the message of hope here is think about, think about first those that are standing outside the walls of the community. And they're starting to hear these messages, that they can be a part of it, that what Christ lifts up is different than what the world lifts up. The brokenness that we see and feel actually is of benefit 
when it's harnessed in the correct way of faith. The idea that Sean, from a worldly perspective, may have seen of, of lesser value, but when you start to experience that relationship, you realize his impact was well beyond anything that, we've, that I've ever experienced. And then I can look back on that in amazement. And so the crowds are asking these questions. The challenge, I think, it fits when you think about the religious leaders. For us, in some ways, as the church, for me, is that it's easy to put faith in a way that we want to measure it. It's like, oh, if I do this, this, and this, then I'm good, I'm faithful. I can remember a conversation I had with someone, and as the words came out of my mouth, I knew I was in trouble. We were talking about some service project, something we had to do, and I made the comment, I cannot give anymore. And as soon as those words came out, I knew I was off. I knew there was something wrong because I was called to give of myself, to lay down myself. But I wanted to say that I had given enough. I'd wanted to say that I had done enough. I'd wanted to say that I'd been faithful enough. And yet that's not how our faith works because when it changes our core, we don't look for the measurements. We look to see where God is leading us. Our core changes. There's a story of St. Francis, and I love this story, and I'm sure I'll mess some of it up. But he really had a heart for the poor. And his dad, who had money, would give him money for their order, because he was over an order. So he'd give him money for the order in order to make sure he was okay and had food and the order was okay. Well, what St. Francis took things very literally. That was one of his, his challenges. So he would take the money and he would just basically filter it right through to those out on the street. So finally, his dad basically was like, I got to put an end to this. I keep giving you money, and you keep tossing it away. So he calls in basically the, those that are over top of, say, of Francis and pulls them into the room, and it's like, you can't keep doing this. We are going to restrict you from giving it, because it was basically like, you know, if they needed repairs or they needed food for the monks, they would just take it and give it to those out on the street. And he's like, the money has to stay here. And so, of course, in St. Francis's manner, he takes off everything that he has, his clothes, strips completely naked, and walks out the door. He's like, here, you can have it all. I'm done. And he leaves. And as, at his core, it, it directed him what to do. And I think about that in the challenge we have from the standpoint of standing there from those who are on the side of of the institution or the religion. We want those guidelines, and, and they are necessary in places, but there's always a conflict, and we always have to rub up against that and try to figure out what is it that we are being called to do? And is it being faithful to the Sermon on the Mount, to loving, to caring, to being willing to reconcile, to do unto others as we would want to do? To do to that, to, for them to do to us. I told you I'd come back to Sean. I remember it clearly. Um, I, we were, I had moved, and it was the, the time that that phone call came. He was 27 years old. He was in Chicago ministering to people. It was called Japuza, Jesus People USA, and he ministered to the people on the streets. And they would do these big concerts, and they would do all these different events. And he was there serving, doing what he could do. And it was a hot day, and they had a big concert, and his body finally gave out. And it was a heartbreaking call because every one of us had had a close relationship, had this thought going through our mind. If we would have been there, we would have seen the signs, we could have taken care of him and got him out, and he would be okay. It was heartbreaking to have that thought process. But when we took a deep breath and step back, we realize that he chose to go where God was leading him, and he did things that were unimaginable in our minds for the kingdom of God. And he had an impact that radiated through us, through the people that he was with. He listened to the Sermon on the Mount, and he chose to follow. He chose to go forward. Our challenge is, what will we do? How will we respond to it? For the disciples, this was a pivotal moment. Were they going to take his words and build, or were they going to ignore and walk away? 
Each of us has to wrestle with that question individually. What will we do with the words? How will we respond? Because I think when we start to step back and let God be at the core of who we are, we can only go in one direction. I think God will lead us out to do the things God is leading us to do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your words. And we pray that you will change our hearts so that we may know where you are leading us, Lord, and that we may be your, your hands and feet, that we may be willing to go and be your children at our core. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.